league already. A lot of the players who get really high, they have the mentality that they want to win. But sometimes you also have to learn how to be selfless and therefore work with your teammates as well. It's like as a jungler, you have to call early, right? There's just no way that you're not calling early. So you have to just keep that rolling. Welcome back everyone to the LEC studio. SK Gaming and Astralis have both gone through a huge rebuild and in a few minutes, the new players get a chance to prove themselves. Let's start with SK Gaming. We just heard from Tanks, he's one of the four new players on SK and that in the jungle position, they're only keeping Genax from last year's roster. We're gonna get them up on the screen here, but that's a huge overhaul for the brand. Yeah, when you bring in four out of five new players, you know that there's gonna be a, a big change in the way the team plays and Betty was talking talking to me earlier a lot about how he saw SK play around crown shot a lot in uh, summer of last year. Like the, the idea was we can get ahead, but then we funnel our resources into crown shot and he is our key way to carry. And so what I'm looking forward to seeing from SK this split is where their key carry points are because players like Tinks, players like Jezu, players like Blue have all shown they can carry at a regional level. I think that the clear difference is that we're not gonna see an AD carry focused play style, I think, from this SK gaming squad. When you have big carries in the form of Tinks and the expectations being so high on blue, I'm expecting more from this mid-jungle duo than what we saw in the past. And one of the big things for SK last split for me was that I thought that their macro was actually pretty good. I thought that they won a lot of their games to pretty smart play and good map control. And I'm hoping that through the, the coaching staff, they've largely kept the same. We're going to continue to see that same level of macro this year. Yeah, and talking to Jez as their coach, he says, there is an expectation when you put Tinks on your team that he is going to be the focal point, right? Like that he's going to be the key guy to carry because everyone's been so excited about this up and coming jungler for the last couple of years. But Jezus is very focused on making sure that they are not the Tinks team. They yep. are not like what Self Made was last year with Fnatic. It's not all about him a lot of the time, but instead you can use Blue and you can use your bot lane to actually carry the game as the games go on. Let's see what happened. Uh, I like that they've invested in talent that comes from the regional leagues, that comes from the TCL, it's been doing very well. Also, call out for another Belgian, uh, Belgian and Turkish nationality. <laughs> Blue in the mid lane, we gotta, I gotta rep my countrymen um, <laughs> when they do find their way to the league. But that is SK, a lot of question marks, but a lot of excitement. And let's talk about Astralis. Of course, Astralis is picking up where Project Origin ended. And unfortunately, it ended quite tragically, you know, last place in the league. Now Astralis is putting their brand name in the hands of these unproven largely and some proven players, but not in terms of winning the titles yet. I think that when you look at fans' perspectives, this is not a team that is going to do well. Like we asked on Twitter, what did people think? And pretty exclusively, everyone put Astralis in last yeah. place. And I think that it's kind of expected when you see a lot of these names, they're actually familiar. Nuke Duck, Promise Q, Jessica White Knight, they've all been in the league before and they have not been able to find success. The fresh blood that we're getting is in the jungle of Zanzara. And I think for a lot of these players working their way back up through the regional leagues and actually finding success there, they're hoping to prove that they can still compete with some of the top players. Here. I'm definitely going to look at it and look at, yes, it is the brand of Astralis that carries so much weight in uh, Counter-Strike, of course, and in esports as a whole, but these players now have a new chance to prove themselves. Yep. And let's look at the jungle matchup specifically. We talked a lot about Tinks already, who, by the way, one of his alliances is like EU Kanavi. Uh, <laughs> and we have Zanzara on Astralis in the jungle role. How is this going to play out? What do we know about these two players playstyle wise? Well, I think we already know that Tinks is an incredibly smart jungler. He's very good at following his opponent, understanding the pathing, and then setting his lanes up for success. Uh, when we watched him in the regional leagues, it was him and his mid laner duo wing together that could really get their team ahead, that really accelerated LDLC. And I think when you look at Zanzara, he is just a large voice in any team that he is on. I had the pleasure of hearing from DeFisher when he used to play for that Origin regional team that he was just such a pleasure and people only ever had good things to say about him because of how vocal he is, how funny he is. And I do hope we get an interview from him soon because I know he's a personality that EU fans are going to love. Yeah, it's going to be great, but making jokes doesn't get you the W's on the <laughs> board. It's going to have to be the performance. So there's a lot of question marks around these lineups. So let's see what happens when they clash on the Rift. Thank you very much, Shox. Pleasure to be bringing you game two as well. Still Dracos here with Kadrel. Uh, I'd say first game was an absolute bloodbath. We'll see if game two follows suit, but I kind of want to continue this discussion that we were hearing on the analyst as Kadrel, because when we were talking about this game, we also talked a lot about mid and jungle specifically. Yeah, I mean, Tinks has been one of those players which has been hyped for so many years, you know. I remember he had tryouts on Schalke around two or three years ago for the main team. There was lots of whispers around him going to LEC, but he never really made it. You have Treats, who's really similar. Everyone on TSM wants him to play. So lots of hype around the SK roster. And I think that the Astralis built a really, really solid roster in terms of playstyles, like, like kind of meshing well together. 
Yeah, and I think you look about it, obviously there's a lot of baggage for Astralis once Origin. And if you're an Origin, former Origin fan, now a Astralis fan, or an Astralis fan now that is carrying some of that baggage with you, I encourage you to let it go as we get into Champ Select. New team, new year, new project for both of these organizations. It's time to see who will come out on top and see what their version of the meta looks like. Not all scrims, or not all teams uh, scrim in the same things you have to imagine. So we'll see what the priority is going to be. Yeah, and I think there's just two really good narratives around this team. You know, Origin finishing 10th last split with superstar players. They brought in four kind of young-blooded players that they want to revitalize the team with. Kept Nuke Duck, who is essentially a core part of the team as a mid laner. And then you have SK, who's just thrown all these hyped players together alongside Gen X to try and prove that the EU rookies and such like this are still super good. And I think I think SK will surprise us anyway, but the bands are coming out. Lilia's banned away, Talia's banned away, still got Olaf, still got things like the Pantheon as well, which is banned away, and things like the Kai'Sa as well, which are open. Interesting to see the Lilia ban too, but I, I completely agree. You know, have to see what's going to work out here. Obviously, Origin was a team, now Astralis, that needed to make big changes after those very crushing finishes. SK Gaming made playoffs. You know, they had a pretty solid run, all things considered. So I was a bit surprised to see these big of changes, but I am excited to see now how they work out as we get to our first pick, because Yes, God bless. Olaf has been banned. No core drinker, Olaf, this time around. But we do get to see how powerful Kai'Sa is. Yeah, Kai'Sa, first pick worthy champion. Not many uh, champions match up to it. You have the Jin, you have the Aphelios, who needs the Thresh. Those kind of things kind of match the Kai'Sa in a way, but Kai'Sa is the strongest AD in the game. I'll see what SK picks here. Renekton's open. Uh, Kai'Sa's been taken away. Do you want to match AD? What do you really want to go for here? Yeah, interesting options. Look, onto the Thresh, so I'm expecting a Philios because that's kind of what's been floating around a lot of screams now in Europe. Thresh paired with a Philios is one of the strongest combos, and a Philios needs him because of the Lancer and he has no mobility. And especially in a meta where there's lots of heavy bruisers like Olaf, Rennington, things like Gragas just flashing on you nonstop, you need that support. And obviously we saw this a lot last year where it was the Thresh of the Tom Kench that always had to be paired with these immobile hyper carries because we were looking at things like GPs in the top lane, and if a GP threw an alt down in a team fight, a Philios was unplayable. So good to see that uh, SK are kind of respecting the limitations of the champion and I'm honestly just ready to see what his damage output looks like. I love Aphelios as a champion now that he's not 200 year status anymore because <laughs> uh, it's okay for me to like him now <laughs> um, and we'll see how it, uh, how the matchup works out between Jeskla and Jezu but now we're seeing the Nidalee locked in in the hands Renekton. of Zanzara. Renekton. Is gonna come out? <laughs> Because I was thinking, are they going to pick a support that's got engaged, you know, like Galio or something, but there it is, Renekton. Nidalee's the only AP jungler left available. Lilia and Tilia banned out in terms of A to S tier junglers. Nidalee is the only AP jungler that's really available left, and if you're picking a Nidalee, you may as well pick a Renekton. So, interesting to see if SK want to pick up the Gragas, which we saw last game, you know, Gragas into Renekton. That's what Wunder opted in for. Or do they want to go for something like the jungler, which is going to be a Hecarim. Now, Hecarim is slow to ramp up, but once he gets his items and gets into teamfights, he is a monster with things like the Conqueror jumping in, the ult, huge AoE damage, and he has a really, really beefy frontline. He's basically a bruiser. Yeah, absolutely is. And one of those champions who, where he does get rolling, as you said, Kedro, can one-shot an AD carry, can completely ignore a frontline with that ultimate. So something that has to be respected. And pressure now on Zanzara to get some kind of big advantage in the early game to stop this snowball from coming through. Volibear now going to be banned away. Historically, one of the matchups that fared yep. pretty well into the Renekton was very even at Worlds overall, I would say. More of a skill matchup. The Twisted Fate and now also going to be taken off the board. Yeah, they're banning away stuns, basically, because Nidalee really works off CC. Nidalee needs CC in, well, as many lanes as possible, basically. And she has the Renekton. TF, Nidalee, Renekton is a deadly top side. You get six on the Renek on the TF, you just ult top, three-man dive. It's a complete one-shot. So banning away the Alistair as well. So things like the Galio, the Set, the Leona, these kind of supports are open for the Kai'Sa. She needs some sort of engaged support. She needs a melee support to work with. I'm interested to see if Astralis banning away the Gragas here, because they banned away the Volley Barrier, which is one of the counters. You've also got a champion like Na, which could be a bit annoying. Um, so interesting. They banned away the Nar, so I expect Gragas just for SK. Um, trying to take away, I think there's three champions into Renekton. I haven't seen too much Volley Bear. I mean, I, I, I remember Grass Volley Bear, like you said, at Worlds was good into the Renekton, more of a skill matchup towards the end. But I think that's just three champions into Renekton, and I expect SK to take the third. Yeah, and fully expect uh, Gen X to be very comfortable on the Gragas here as a champion. He's a player who has already roll swapped once in his career and seems to be very comfortable picking up new champs. So, also, I think Gragas in lane. 
Not that complicated. You know, the ER combos that we saw Wonder pulling off last game, there's definitely some finesse there. But for the most part, <laughs> it's, missed a lot of ults. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty tame, I think, as far as mechanically demanding okay. champions go. That said, now we're going to have the set locked in for the support position alongside the Orianna. This may make things a little bit easier against the Hecarim, as you can just ult him out of a fight if you time it well. Yep. I'm expecting an AP mage here from SK. I mean, you've got the Orianna set, Renekton. That three man is such a good engaged sort of team fight zoning control. You have the ball, you have the settled, and then you have Kaiser, who's just going to play off all the, those three champs. So I think Astralis' comp is super well rounded, and that's a victor for the side of SK. So SK has opted for this team fight comp as well. They've gone for the mage. We're seeing two huge team fight comps here, Dracos. I'm so absolutely ready for it. I don't want another game where one team gets a small lead early game and then it falls apart in the mid game, <laughs> Cajal. I want bloodbath. I want fights left and right. But let's talk about the early game. Before everyone is grouping up as five, what are we looking at here, Cajal? Well, I think the Tinks on, and the Hecarim just wants to farm up. He wants to make sure he gets as many sort of CS leads as possible, try and keep clearing his camps, get the six ASAP, and maybe cover top in, in that sort of process as well, because I think that the Astralis have the strongest top jungle in the game, arguably. Yes, Talia can slot in a little bit better than Nidalee because it has less counterplay. But I think the top side of Astralis is super, super strong in the early game, and they have a lot of engagement bot as well. So Astralis definitely the ones who can pull the trigger in the early game. But I think that both comps are scaling, both are teamfight comps, and the only real split push you have is White Knight on the Renekton. Well, it's time to see who comes out on top. Astralis versus SK Gaming starts now. No. Welcome to the Rift. Game two of the day, two brand new lineups setting foot on stage. And Kadro, I'm not gonna lie, man. I'm one, I'm generally hyped because it's day one. Like, how can you absolutely not be excited? But two, also Victor, one of my favorite champions to uh, watch in the off season. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I played one ARAM with him and it went very well uh, with the way his hex core works. Maybe that's all it takes for me. I'm a simple man, Kadro. I like simple things. But in general, now that the hex core is gone, I just feel like this champion is so much more fun to actually build. You can actually make decisions about your build pass. You get to be this kind of weird, short-range, AP Bruiser-style pick, and yep. I just like what he brings to the table. Yeah, and just in terms of lane, I think Victor is just a good match to Orianna. It has its back and forth. I think it's more of a skill matchup in general, but if you look at SK's comp with the Victor ult, the Hecarim ult, the Gragas ult, Aphelios with the AoE gun, perhaps, Astralis's comp is a little bit short-range. You know, if they don't hit a spear, Renekton and Kai'Sa need to dive in, and they're quite short-ranged. If SK's ahead and they pop these ults or these spells into Astralis's face, it's going to be really hard for Astralis to touch the front line of SK, but just in terms of early game, I think that Astralis has the advantage. We see a leash on both side, a leash on top side. So both teams should know where each jungler started, and they should presume that they're both counterpathing. So one's going top side, one's going bot side. And again, the onus is on Astralis to pull the trigger here in the early game. They are the ones with the advantage. Not that they immediately have to, but certainly are favored to do so as we take a look at some of these early Ooh. matchups. That's going to be the immediate flash forward from Promise Q, trying to get things kicked off right up here against Treats. They're trying to get one more auto, one more proc there, but it won't quite be enough. But not unexpected to see the aggressive early flash burn coming in here from the set. I think good read from Promise Q to do that, because the Hecarim is not going to come bot and gank you, yep. so you just got to have a Hex Flash field day here on the bottom side. Yeah, a couple things to note there. He knew that bot leashed, so he was really not afraid to engage early. Set works with the Hex Flash so well. He doesn't need Flash. He just throws it out level 1 all the time, because he knows he doesn't need Flash, and the jungler's pathing top. The only problem is all they really got out of that was Exhaust. Promise Q used Flash, Ignite, and Jeskly used Heal, and all they got was the Exhaust from SK. Yes, they get the push. Yes, they can walk up River and place a ward on the respawn Gromp if they want to, but that's all they really got out of it, and it's not a huge loss for Astralis, but I would have expected more. Definitely would. Good on SK to make it out only burning the one summoner spell. And obviously for Astralis, it would be very different if maybe they managed to proc that Plasma stack coming in from Jeskla, force more pots out, but Thresh no pots now, maybe, maybe they can get a greater advantage out of this, but... Right now, it's definitely not looking like a positive trade. If they get some Hex Flash value, it could shift back, but all things considered overall, the rest of the map remaining relatively calm. Pressure for Renekton right now early on as Gen X has been forced back here. Yeah, both mid laners just kind of even farming. White Knight does have a top wave stacking, so Tinks being around could be a bit dangerous for him if he doesn't crash the wave, but you can see just cleared out the creeps. He's going to back off. Ooh. But he wants to crash the wave, which is a bit Ooh. greedy, so That's he's going to get a caster curse. He's not backing off. He's going to get knocked back, but he does have the flash. second dash Ooh. there. Body slam flash follow from Gen X. A flash out from White Knight trying to get the heal from the Cold of Meek. In the meantime, he's going to turn it right Ooh. back with the stun. The Conqueror now proc. Tank is going to walk in, but he thinks better of it. Does not want to start on the stage running it under tower. Yeah, well played from White Knight there. He stunned Tinks on his auto attack, so he couldn't actually get the killing blow. Does manage to escape by trading flash for Ghost and Flash on the side of SK. 
he wanted to crash the wave. He knew that if Genax froze the wave in his face there, he'd have to back off and TP back. And if he TPs back, things can still gank him, you know, and this wave is still going to be bad. So you can't really blame White Knight for walking up. He has TP'd into this river to try and stop the crab, but thinks he's going to take that one away. So TP advantage to SK and across the board, even trade other than the summoner spells in topside. Yeah. Tinks is going to be forced to stop the recall there. Doesn't want to give away too much information as to where he's going. Maybe put some doubt in the minds of Astralis. But Zanzara, this is free license to invade the bottom side mm -hmm. of the map. Should be able to take away Gromp if he spots it. Maybe not if he spends too much time. Gets the perfect timing on the Wolf respawn there. Yeah, he knew um, Tinks started bot side, did three camps in the top. Saw that he full cleared when he ganked top. So he knew that this bot camp's respawning around 4 minutes, 24 minutes, 30. Does pick up the Wolves. I think if he goes for the Gromp, it's a bit greedy. So I expect him to back off after this, but he will spot out Tinks before he starts it, so... He should be fine. Tinks doesn't have the Ghost, he'll back off. And that Warden the Gromp, like we said earlier, it's just giving information to Astralis. And I think information is one of the key things in League of Legends. If you know where people are, you don't have to be scared to trade or do whatever you want on the map. And Zanzara's just not missing a spear. That's two in a row that he's hit. Tinks, of course, has the item advantage with the Sheen completed. He has backed, but Zanzara has to be careful. Promise Q could just come over the wall. Treats is there to cover. And when we look at it, Kedril, I think we talked a lot about the jungle matchup. I want to talk a little bit about mid lane as well, because obviously Blue is this guy who has been hyped up a lot. If you've been following the rookie scene at all, he was very dominant domestically in the TCL, kind of talked about as one of the new prodigy mid laners coming into EU. And I feel like Nuketuck is the guy at the gate for every new mid laner who says like, all right, you think you're good? Yeah. Got to take down Nuke Duck. And right now, Orianna definitely winning out in the lane pressure. Yeah, Nuke Duck has full push in mid. Promise Q is hopping around bot side to see where Tinks goes. So he's essentially being kind of herded into his own jungle here. Zanzara took away the Raptors. He was fighting him on the Gromp. He has the mid push. Lots of trades onto blue. Heals up Nuke Duck. So Zanzara being really proactive here. And I love what Promise Q is doing. He's staying in the bot side river. Essentially saying, if Tinks, if you want to go for our Raptors, I'm going to stand in your face. So he's just getting a camp lead for Zanzara there. And now Tinks is going to have to go for his Krux. There's another ward there. So he's going to get spotted out again. So just a really good. Good proactive early game from Astralis, getting information and just slowly creeping ahead in the jungle. And of course, this is one of the things that makes that early flash trade on the bottom side of the map feel so much better for Astralis, is that because they've been able to sustain a lot of this lane pressure, Thresh is, is a, just a glorified Tom Kench right now. He has to sit in that lane with Aphelios, be that safety net, just chill, because they are not in a position for the Thresh to roam. Now that's going to change as we move further into the game, but for now, it feels like Promise Q definitely showing his face much more on the map overall. Yeah, I think the only issue Astralis has right now is Zanzar hasn't based, so once he bases, I think they'll lose a lot of tempo on the map. You can see Tinks walks in here, he's going to clear away the pink and he runs straight past it, but I think he did spot it. Yeah, he's going to go for it. And the problem is Zanzara can't contest it. The only kind of bad thing is, like I said, he hasn't based, but he is level 6 now. So the Nidalee's level 6. He's going to base, path towards a Drake perhaps, and just start playing with Promise Q, trying to get these leads. And I think that Astralis just have three pushing lanes, and the Zanzara is just playing really well around. They timed the Wolves, took the Raptors with the mid-push, made sure he full cleared his camps, stopped Tinks getting them. And now how can he use this advantage in the jungle to affect other lanes? No, yep. we see the setup here on the bottom side of the map, getting that control ward down kind of paving the way for Zanzara if he does want to come support this lane with the lane gank or through the river. That said, a little bit of mid prio or even mid rather, is going to make sure that, oh, well, it's not going to make sure of anything, actually. Here comes Nidalee, seven health. Zanzara, though, no smite available means he can't contest. Goes away. Tink's forced to run for the hills. Now, can he invite, invade his bot side? He should call Promise Q over here and try and get the bot push, try and stop Tink's from getting to level six as fast as possible, maybe deny the blue buff. You can see Zanzar is playing really smart here, using his prio lanes. He didn't go top and get give blue hand off to Nuke Duck because he knew Tink's could full clear for free. Now he's gone to bot side, he's using the bot push, making sure he's pushing the advantage and just keeping keeping himself active on the map, keeping in Tink's his face, making sure he can't scale for free. And the thing that's important to remember when we look at this Astralis lineup overall is that, yes, it is a new team, but it is not a rookie team by any means. So it's not super surprising to see such clean fundamentals from this lineup overall. But I would say surprising to see them so early. But the fantastic use of lane pressure is a pleasure to watch from players who have not spent that much time playing together. Yeah, and I just love the efficiency from Zanzar. If you just look at the map in general, you can see he's going to take the Drake. His bot camps are just about respawning. He can do Drake, clear his bot camps to the top side, and then start playing with the Renekton 6 to play for the Herald. And he's just playing around this map super perfectly, I think. And he's also got the Lucidity Boots, too. So he's just accelerating with that extra ability haste, his clear so much more. Also, Summoner Spell haste. So he is just power farming up, as well as getting that big objective that can support the team. Yeah, and you can saw on the minimap there, Pink's Towards the Herald. SK pushed in bot wave and the question mark being promise you because they're wondering why is he freezing bot? Let's run Herald. Let's ignore that freeze. We know if we leave the map how it is, Zanzar and White Knight are going to take topside control because of the jungle advantage.
advantage. So let's just blow the map open. Let's just go mid, push in the wave, and just go four man top. What's the Charles going to do? Can they answer it? Well, they, t they made sure they unfroze the wave, but it will push into SK, and they're trying to run up to the top side river to try and contest this Herald, which they know hasn't just been started, and they should arrive in time. So, Dracos, I think this might be a 5v5. Oh, man, Genex has TP. Have to be careful. But blue there. has no ult, and neither does Noob Duck. So that's a really key thing to make sure, like, to keep in mind here. Important note: Zanzara also no real ultimate here. So have to be careful. Have to respect the Hecarim to a certain degree. That said, White Knight right now very strong. Level seven Renekton compared to the rest of the competition, not one to be underestimated. Zanzara's gonna throw another hook. The flash, the hook on Treats, and it's the perfect target. The sidestep is not what the team needed. Immediate first blood though. Now just burning through the team. A double kill for Aphelios. What? SK. He just invited Astralis over for dinner. Astralis, don't say yes, dudes. Yeah, I don't think Jeskla was expecting that hook to hit because Nuketuck flashed away on the last kind of second of it and then just hit Jeskla coincidentally because he was behind Nuketuck, so he gets popped in the fight and then Astralis just have to run away. White Knight tried to defend it, but they're going to lose Herald and now this early jungle advantage that Zanzara has played well around has kind of been lost in the game is kind of blown open. They've got the lane swap, which they wanted. They've got two kills on Aphelios, which is the hardest killing champ, and they get the Herald. So you can see here, just really interesting decision from Treats here. He flashes forward. He sees three or four people stacked up, so he knows no matter what he hits, he's going to hit something. So you can see here, the Herald's resetting. Astralis just want to get better positioning. Treats decide, well, there's three people there. Someone's going to get hit. Nuda flashes out. Jessica gets hit by the, just the last part of it. Gets taken down. White Knight goes down too. And SK get everything they want from that. Really good. And that if that fight does not go that well, it's very risky to do that. But one of the things that I, I really love about the SK composition is that it's really hard for Astralis to leap into them at this stage of the game because while Orianna, you know, she's got to wait till six, she's got that shockwave as her major CC cooldown. Victor W is so incredibly oppressive for short range compositions. You cannot comfortably run at a Victor at any point in the game. Yeah, the thing about you're fighting in a dragon, right? You've got the Victor W, the Victor ult, the Gragas ult, the Hecarim ult, Aphelios is throwing his ult with AoE guns. You have to care for the hook as well. So Astralis have to play these fights super carefully. And the only thing they have really in response is the shockwave with the set flip. That's all they've really got. But if Astralis can set well around objectives up and then get vision first, then they should be able to stop SK from getting the objective first place because they have a lot of poke. They have good vision control right now. You see Nuke Duck hovering top side, trying to get some advantage, making sure they keep vision here. But he is going to have to back to mid to catch the wave. But difficult, Cajal, because again, similar to last game, we're in a situation where one jungler and one team kind of build up an early advantage, play very well around these, you know, incremental, very small advantages. It looks like it's starting to build into something. And then a single small mistake, or in this case, a single good call from SK, I think, on forcing this Herald uh, shifts the game right back in the favor of the opposing team. So for SK, they're feeling very comfortable. Yep, definitely very comfortable. And you can see the lane swap is active, but both jungles are bot side. So it's not like there's much happening in this lane swap. Uh, both junglers are just making sure they keep farming, because the thing is, if you take your foot off the gas, the jungler, and the other one doesn't, you're going to fall a level or two behind really quickly. So I like that both junglers keep farming. The only problem they have right now is Astralis need to make something happen, because I think, like we mentioned a couple times, the zone control that SK has in team fights, the amount of spells they have to shut down Jessica and Nukedark from being able to step forwards, is uh, it's a bit too much. So Tinks has the Herald. He has full cleared bot side. He's round top side now, so he needs to make sure he can bring blue from mid to top to make sure they have a number advantage. Multi coming in is going to try to knock Nukedark back. The shockwave comes in, but it might be too little too late. That said, the dissonance and the extra move speed there is going to take Nuke Duck out to safety. Base rush, certainly a very strong mastery in mid lane on the current patch. Yeah, I think you could see what Tinks was going for there, right? Absolutely. Nuke Duck, no flash, ults over the wall, tries to gap close by getting behind him, push him into blue, but just not enough damage to take him down. Nuke Duck is going to base, probably TP back towards mid as the Drake is spawning in 40 seconds. And I got the Herald going to be dropped mid. TP coming in. Remember, no ultimate for Nuke Duck means he's not really going to be able to clear this wave out as quickly as he would like They have TP to. as well. This could be massive. Promise Q on the flank. They have spotted him out. They have to be careful. Jezu caught out. Knocked back under tower. He cannot afford to stand there, but there is the White lantern Knight. right in time. Treat's not going to connect the hook on this time. We'll throw down the ultimate, but there's White Knight on the backside. The immediate stun follow-up. Where's it going to be? Blue now in trouble. Boom. Haymaker not going to connect. Blue running as for his life. His Tinks goes for the body block. Everybody low, but Astralis holding on. Yeah, I feel like Astralis should have got way more there. I just think there's just more small mechanical inches misplays there. Tinks and Blue both get away on one HP. Yes, Astralis win the fight. Yes, they get the shutdown. Yes, they'll get the Drake, but I feel like the position that they had there, they should have got way more, but that TP from White Knight was super, super crucial in that fight. Yeah, finding the Renekton. The Renekton finds a way into the back line. It is a tough game for SK. Astralis now going to find their second Drake of the game as we take a look back at this fight and 
If you're wondering why you picked Thresh with Aphelios, by the way, this, this, this is, is why. This is why you picked Thresh with Aphelios. This is why Aphelios can't be played. Well, it can be, but not really with other supports. So he gets flipped, Flash flipped. Flash takes the Lantern just in time, dodges Xanzaro's combo, and White Knight behind. He does get in the fight, but his Q was empowered. You can see he doesn't have Rage now, so the W is not as long as he would want it to be. The stun wasn't enough. Xanzaro flashes forward, and if the stun was a tiny bit longer and Xanzaro played, uh, if White Knight played better around his Rage, he could have got two there, perhaps, but it's not the end of the world. They get the shutdown. They get the kill onto the side of White Knight, which will need that kill on the side lane against this Gregas. Oof. And checking in just across the board, I mean, good news for SK on the back of that one is they've got some mythic item completions in the Divine Sunderer as well as the Gale Force for the Felios. Bad news is that that Herald that they admittedly got a lot off of that fight but also invested a lot for really was not as effective as they wanted to be. Would have liked to break that tower. Jezu though, not quite fully stacked. Shurikens will fall off, so Jessica should feel pretty comfortable to approach the wave here as Promise Q returns to lane. Yeah, Jezu stepping forward there. He had the Lantern, so he knew he was absolutely safe. Now the key thing to look at now is the fact that Astralis has two dragons and it's an Ocean Soul, which is game-changing as Blue has no flash. I thought, moving forward, Blue. Is he just gonna get shredded down? That's just too much damage. Zanzara. And Nuke Duck, solid teamwork there in the jungle mid. Yeah, really well played. Blue had no vision there, does get picked up by Nuke Duck. And that's a quick kill for the side of Zanzara, which he needs these kills as Nidalee to start getting the ball rolling. He's gonna get the kill, they're gonna push in mid. Maybe Nuke Duck can get a free base now, but... Stratus' mid tower is a bit low on HP, and I think that these ga this game will come down to the Dragons. And of course, eventually that means that uh, SK are probably going to be forced to fight on Astralis' terms. If it continues this way, they're going to be forced to engage into Astralis. Difficult thing to do. And oh, certainly Gen much better than the other way around. As Gen X going to try to body slam through, but they're not going to get a body block him there. Spear now going to land, but Tink's on the way in. White Knight immediately backing out there. Big ulti now coming in. They're going to try to take out the Renekton, but I don't know if that's a target that you can actually shut down at this point. Treats, though. Bringing it back up is Jezu also coming into the fight, and Zanzar just continuing to throw spears over the wall. They will slowly, but surely, take White Knight down. Well played by the side of SK. Yeah, good pick up for the side of SK there. The thing is, Jezu and Treats had already rotated to mid. I don't think White Knight saw it in time, because he went in for the fight, and then he realized they were on the way through River. Tried to run away, but good knockback from uh, Gen X and the Gragas. So we've made sure he picked him up. They're going to lose bot tower for that rotation to mid, though, but they will answer with the mid tower. So overall, a net, play, a net good play there from the side of SK. White Knight loses his life. And I think this game is looking to be quite an even game. And like I said, 2 minutes 30 on the next Drake. I think he's going to pick up this Herald. And I think everyone needs to get their item spikes ASAP for this next Drake. Uh, potentially rinse and repeat on the mid lane Herald as well. The second one just about guaranteed to break that down. His core drinker is now completed for White Knight. So that same play probably will not be possible the next time around. Although who knows? Nidalee may be able to pick something up. And it appears that we're going to have some supportive itemization coming in for the Nidalee. At least that's what the Kindle gem would indicate. Potentially a Vandal Glass Mirror to follow. And then either the Mandate or the Moonstone Renewer. I think the issue that Zanzara has on this Nidalee is if he jumps in, the Gragas Body Slam can stop him getting onto the target. They have the Thresh play. Victor has the uh, the W, the zone control. It's going to be pretty difficult for him in team fight, so he needs to make sure he plays over side lane. Try to get White Knight ahead. Try to get the towers on the side lane as much as he can, because... The only real team fight pressure that they have is the Oriana and the Kai'Sa, but they need a couple more items to get scaling up. And additionally, I think this is one of those games where you look at a champion like Nidalee and Set, who would love to play with a bit more vision advantage, would love to play for flanks. Uh, and until you break mid-tier one, I think it's really hard to successfully pull that off. So personally, would love to see Astralis take the necessary steps. That said, SK definitely not giving them any kind of leeway at this point in the game. Is Jezu and Treats are going to take their time, hide, maybe hoping to catch Nuke Duck out as he pushes this wave back in. But Nuke Duck, very patient there, and Treats and Jezu just going to step yeah, in. Yeah, Jezu gets the mid-push. Now they need to try and push SK out of this top side so Nuke Duck can start playing aggressive. Promise Q stepping up. He well, does have the Blast going. So he's going to be able to get away. But like you see, Astralis just needs to control top side because they know Tinks has Herald. They know that Tinks wants to use a Herald on either top or bot tower because mid tower has been taken down. And it needs to make sure they keep answering this Herald until the dragon spawns in one minute. I expect them to run back top side, make sure Nuke Duck can push, move down the river, and group up to the dragon as five. Eyes on that objective. As you said, drag dragon's probably going to be the key to victory here. Nuke Duck has got the TP, so he could push it in base and try and TP towards mid if he wants to. But 40 seconds on the Dragon. Whoever has the Vision Control always has the advantage. So Tink's already walking in, showing himself there. They see the pinks, so it's just a kind of poke battle for the Vision. The vision. Nuketuck is going to base. I expect him to TP on this mid wave, and the waves are really important to play around. If they can push in this mid wave and move into River, SK always have to answer the wave. 
and they should be able to get vision control. And important to note that it looks like two waves are being sacked in this play in the top lane yep. in order to keep some pressure here around the dragon. They very much have to be careful. Treats, there is no Thresh to lantern you oh, out, no. buddy, but the hook hits and it might not matter. Sanzara goes golden, but he should still get stunned up here. Is forced to flash out to safety. Excellent, Abelio Salt now coming in. That's going to be one Ooh. big Hecarim Malt. That is one fleeing Kaisen now. Jeff tries to run for the hills. A little bit of extra damage. Is forced to flash out to safety. Barrel knocks Promise Q right back into the wall. Set should be done, but they're not going to follow up. Setting their eyes on the prize. They know the Drake is what they need to play for as White Knight dashes over the wall. Genex still very tanky. The Leandris from Nuke Duck, not quite enough damage to burn him down yet. Yeah, Zanzar getting caught out there. You could see them poking and prodding for the vision. Treats does hit another key hook for the objective, so they're going to start up this dragon. I think Astralis want to fight this 4v5. White Knight has ult. He has flash. He gets hooked, though. Oh, already has been locked up. Now trying to double dash with the team. Of course, has the Gore Drinker as well, so it will be difficult to knock down. But the Body Slam stops him from coming back over the wall with the Blast Cone. SK with priority access here. Zanzara not in the area. Should mean that they can take this one down. They do get it. Going over to Jezu, not a clean smite, but a dragon, and that's really all that matters. Yeah, I was wondering why White Knight wasn't TPing in. I don't think he had a ward behind them, so he couldn't actually enter the fight when they were fighting towards the entrance of the Raptors, but good play from SK there. They follow up on the hook. Genax TPs in, they commit to the play. They force Jessler out as well, so pretty good pickup for them as we see it again. I think, like we said, they want to push in mid so they can contest the vision. They just need to stay together more. Nuke Talk and Promise Cure on one side, Zanzar is on the other, Jessler is on the other side as well, so Treat just kind of says, guys, is he hinting? Throws the hook. Make sure they get the engage, and then the root from Jezu was key because now they're all clumped up. Tinks jumps in, and you can think, well, why isn't White Knight TPing? I think the TP just came up now, and he has no walls behind him, so there's not many room for TPs there. And uh, yeah, they tried to pick up Gen X, but they didn't have enough. And while the early game was really clean from Astralis in terms of using lane pressure, roaming between the lanes, using the small advantage that they were building for themselves, this mid game has looked a little bit sloppier. You saw Nuked up, you know, use the ultimate there trying to find the kill on the trees, trying to isolate someone, but there's no follow-up, no one's in position to deal damage. And as a result, even though you still got four members uh, in Astralis or three members around that pit, the potential may be to turn if you have that ultimate. They just don't have the damage to really do anything and essentially have to pray for a missed smite. And admittedly, they were close. Aphelios did get the Drake, but not the situation you want to be in. The problem is they need White Knight in those fights so he can be in the front line, make sure that he can be the zoning tool from SK, throwing their ults on the back line and forcing them to run backwards. They need to be able to run forwards and start hitting them. Uh, so I think if White Knight was in that fight, it would have been a bit different, but still well played from SK. And I think Treats' hooks have been the key this game to unlocking kills for SK and getting in the objectives. And you can see why, you know, angry TSM fans were talking about having him put onto the, the main <laughs> roster for so long. He is doing it. And to be honest, when he stepped forward to throw that hook, I thought he was dead. Like, if that missed, I thought for sure they would try to turn the fight on that. But no, he does manage to land. It takes the most crucial member out in the fight coming, just the jungler, because no longer is it a 50-50. But up. now, Jezu's yes, going to be in trouble. Jessica does go in, and again, Thresh saving the day here. Yeah. Another reason why you need Thresh for the Filios. <laughs> it's Lanterns pretty much just the one again. reason. Yeah. It's the Lantern. You saw Jester jump in with the Gale Force there. Use It's the ult as well. Tries to pick up Jezu. Forces the Lantern out. And yes, they'll get tempo on the map. Yes, Jezu will have to base. But there's no real objective to play for. The only real one is top tier one. But I'm not sure if they're in position to do so. Because I think Blue can just run up here. Presses E and clear out the wave. So a bit of a lull state now for the game. All just trying to wait for item spikes and trying to fight around this dragon. I think two or three item spikes, what you need on these mages, on these hyper carry ADs. And then it's all around Baron vision. One shotting Baron if you can, if the enemy team is out of position. Yeah, We're trying absolutely. to pick them off on wards if they step too far forward. And especially when the Archangels and the Seraphs start to come through, that item is just so incredibly strong in terms of how much raw AP it provides for you. That said, we're starting to see this uh, top lane matchup start to shift the same way it did in our previous matchup, where, yes, Renekton very strong, can be very good in these early skirmishes, but eventually, Gragas just hits this point where his cooldowns are so low, and his passive heals him so much, especially when paired with the Grasp, that you cannot really win unless you're willing to extend a trade for a minute. Yeah, and he has the percent HP damage as well, so he never really falls off in the fights. So like you said, too much cooldown reduction, too tanky, and it's going to be a really difficult side lane for White Knight, who is a level down as well. We saw this last game as well, Gragas versus Renekton. Gragas having the upper hand, and that's why it's considered sort of like a counter pick because towards the late stages, if Renekton's on ahead, he's just too tanky as SK. We saw them earlier around 30 seconds ago get topside vision. Now they're using that to make sure they get the tier one top. And Astralis is going to get the mid wave, so what can they trade it for? I think if they step up for the tower, it's a bit risky. Promise Q's in a position where he's looking for a die, but I think Gen X is a bit too tanky, but they might go for it anyway. Very risky, because it's going to take a long time to kill Gen X. Yep. Gen X, not really any tools, though, to just delete might this way. Doesn't find like any. So, I think Astralis actually went out on that trade there. Getting the mid tower is way more important than getting the top tower. Yeah, absolutely. 
We'll see what the side lanes look like. Maybe they can get more out of this as White Knight potentially has overstayed his welcome. Jezu going to step forward. Onslaught getting procs just to get as many shurikens as possible. Swap through for the Chakram. Has the Gale Force with the Cloud Burst as well, but he's going to find the stun under the tower. Tinks pulled out to safety. And I feel like Treats is babysitting this game. Everyone wants to dive, and Treats just has to stay a mile back to throw out these lanterns. Yeah, that was really, really clean from White Knight there. Flashed the knockback from Tinks to make sure that he went backwards rather than forwards. And SK is just going to have to run for the hills there. They do trade the Ghost for White Knight's Flash and ult. They didn't manage to take him down. And Dragon in 30 seconds, another key point of the game. So White Knight has a TP. That's why he's running top. Nuke Duck sprinting towards the bot side mid. And I think they're going to start controlling the bot side here. SK is down on tempo. You can see them all in base. So it looks like Astralis is going to have some sort of vision, vision control by the time they get there. Small item advantage right now as Blue has not backed quite yet. Not, doesn't look like they're going to be able to leverage it, however. 16 seconds on the Drake. Maybe, maybe they can just immediately force a fight. But double TP up and available for SK. Could set the stage for a very important battle. Yeah, Tinks is in base as well. Blue's TPing back to the mid wave. The mid wave is crucial in the mid game. If you can get the mid wave in, they have to answer the mid wave. You can control the vision. So, Stratus putting four people here. Even White Knight's just rotating down. I think he should have been hitting top tower and uses TP, but another hook from Again? Treats. Are you kidding me, Treats? Jungler has been caught out, but there is no follow up this time around. Treats potentially overstaying his welcome. Gravity Field goes down and buys Gen X the space he needs to continue to threaten on the front line, but he has to be careful. Zanzara stunned up. Almost no damage onto Gen X. That is one tanky boy with a flashback. Set throwing Gen X into the back line. Gen X now trying to move through the entire team. That's the Hecarim barreling on through. But Gen X now on a killing spree. White Knight has to run for the hills. And Astralis are not strong enough to stand toe to toe with SK. Yeah, White Knight and Promiscu get taken down. They're going to go for the Dragon here. You saw Promiscu just flash in there. He was tired of Gen X being in their face. They're going to pull the Dragon out to make sure that Zanzara can't see it. But I think he's going to look for it. Does decide to back off. I don't think he has any vision because of the pink ward. And that's a one team fight for SK. I mean, very solid. And again, treats didn't work out quite as well, but impressed by this player already. The confidence in a lot of these hooks, and we'll look back on this game, depending on how the rest of this season goes for him, and either go, wow, he was just that good, or wow, he was just that lucky with some of those. But it's definitely a good start for the player overall, and for SK. Yeah, you can see Treats here hits another crucial hook. Zanzar actually dodged it. I'm not sure about that hitbox, Dracos. That was kind of weird. Call that lolly popping. It's a questionable mechanic. <laughs> but Zanzar pops the stopwatch. Does have the Zonny's Hourglass. And then they try to clump up. And you can see Genex is just eating into five people here. And Luke Duck can't really walk up. Jessler can't really walk up. And this is what we talked about in the draft. It's really hard to walk up. Promise you decides to flash, go in. Genex flashes out. Tinks finds the engage. And White Knight and Promise you. The problem is Astralis is fighting in a choke. Their carries can't really walk forwards because if, if they, they know if they do that, they're going to get AoE down. So Astralis need to find fights which are way more open, perhaps around the mid lane, well, perhaps around the middle of the river. Absolutely. And there were also the point in the game too where they need to be willing to invest the 800 or so gold to get this healing reduction. Right now it is only White Knight with the Bramble Vest, but we need to be able to see that Oblivion Orb uh, or the Executioner's Calling because Gragas healing does not seem like a lot, but you can see there how little the damage matters based on tanky stats and how immediately none of it matters once that passive healing comes through. So it's something that I do think that they have to respect, but I feel like the real nightmare of, of Gragas as a champion right now is that you need both massive amounts of armor penetration to hurt this guy and healing reduction on top of that. So no one champion can really, at least it seems to me, itemize effectively to stop this champion from being a nuisance. Yeah. Gregas is definitely in nuisance with those tank items. Still a level up, still pretty much unkillable in the fights. Jeskla does have two and a half items, Nuke Duck as well. And SK with the one and a half thousand gold leave have full control of this river. And like we said, if this SK comps ahead, it's so hard for the carries of Astralis to do anything. You saw in the last couple fights, it's really hard for them to step forwards, find these aggressive short waves, dive in with the Kai'Sa. And SK is playing around the vision here, looking for the hooks, looking for the engage. Gen X a constant engage threat here. Should also be happy to play these fights slow, especially with the Moonstone Renewer providing that healing over time as Zanzara stays in fight, uh, the fight longer. That said, we are slowly but surely approaching the uh, DPS check that is the Aphelios and the Hecarim. At a certain point, they will just be able to mow your team down. For now, Jezu still a little bit more utility, a little bit more sustained damage than just the raw threat that is a three item carry, but will get only scarier as the game continues. I like this choice from Promiscu. You know, when you're fighting around the Baron, just dropping two wards around the bot side helps with two things. First of all, if they're not bot side, they're top side. So that gives you instant information. Second thing is if they do get one window of control around Baron, and they see a member or two of SK towards bot side, perhaps Tinks 
farming away the Wolves or the Gromp or Jezu trying to go for the items, they can just immediately turn towards the Baron. So these wards are really smart from Promise Q. He knows he can't get deep wards topside, so let's place him bot side. And it gives us, if not equal information, um, to if he had vision topside because he knows where they are. And one thing I do want to call out on the subject of vision is, is how well SK have been, uh, or how consistently, rather, SK have buying control wards. You saw two in the inventory there of Gragas, although I believe he just either placed both of them one back, he placed both of them one after another. Another hook. He's going to land. Treat's not going to find the follow-up, but all of SK contributing to the vision game here this time around, giving them a lot of control over the Baron area. Xanzar is fishing with spears. We're going to go in. Nuke Duck has been isolated. It's going to get caught out here. Where's the follow-up going to go, though? Gen X trying to find it. He's managed to knock Sanzara back to the team one more time. That's going to be Shockwave. Maybe the turn. Knight, White Knight trying to find his way into the back line, trying to get this damage down. Treat trying to find as much space for Jezu as possible. That is a lot of shurikens for the Ophelios if he can keep this fight going. But no, too much damage. It's going to start the follow-up. Jeskla! And that is why you pick the Kai'Sa. At a moment's notice, you can turn a fight on its head. The Collector plus the Gale Force plus the Alt-In and the Isolated Q turns it back. That is huge for the side of Astralis. And you can see here, Treat's fish fishing for the hooks. He's got like this kind of aimbot on Zanzar. Just keep hitting him. And then Tink's kind of got tired of waiting around. Goes for the engage, but I think that he missed his ult and he knows Lutok has the flash, so it's a bit of a confusing engage. And then from there on, it, just, it makes you a little bit seasick, doesn't it? It's just a complete 10-man brawl in the, this kind of small choke. Zanzar gets knocked in, almost a five-man shockwave. Blue's not even there, and then it's just Promiscu with the ult tries to pull them back. They try to take down Tinks, and then Jeskla with this huge play wants to fight. Has kind of stopped. Notices that uh, Jezu is stepping out of position, dives back in, pops in with his Q and auto attacks, and then Ooh. gets the shutdown. So that was a huge, huge play from Jeskla there, making sure that he keeps his team in the game. And now he's picked up the PD, sitting on three items. So it's getting scarier and scarier the longer this game goes on. Both the carries on both teams are scaling really heavily. And something that you have to respect. Obviously, we look at SK, and this is a team that should be very happy to stay clumped in a ball. Treat's kind of your get-out-of-jail free card for when one member overextends. But the Kai'Sa will be that massive front-to-back DPS threat and can also be that dive threat if, for a single moment, the Ophelio steps out of position. So I think pressure on both AD carries to really play this flawlessly as we move later and later into the game. That said, Lips it's Baron up. time. I think they might know that SK is on the Dragon. Tinks and Jezu are there, which are key members. So if Astralis commit to this, they might get it, but they're turning away. Wait, look at White Knight's TP. He's TPing behind them. Blue isolated for now. Can immediately throw down all of his skills before he goes down. He's going to flash out to safety, though. Don't know if that was necessary. And that's going to be three Drakes picked up. This is disaster for Astralis. They made a call, but they did not follow through. Triple Ocean Drake looking at potentially quad Ocean Soul. Treats flash forward. Doesn't get it this time. Now Astralis have to run away. It doesn't look like SK is going to chase them. And that just looked like split decision making from Astralis there. Some of them wanted to do the Baron. Why not want to keep behind? Promiski wanted to engage. His team didn't. So now Astralis have a pretty small issue now. I mean, they don't have enough vision around the Baron to say whether they're on it or not. So they need to make sure they check this safely. And the Kaiser W is going to spot them out. Does SK want to carry on doing this Baron? Promiski is going to be alive. He's going to have the home guards. But Astralis don't have any wards. Their support's dead. So it's really hard for them to face check. They have the Orana Ball, a couple of Blue Orbs, and the, and the Kaiser W. That's all they have. Shockwave. Going to be available, Kaisa ult as well. That's going to be the hook onto White Knight to pull back off the objective. Their focus is on the kill instead, and that's going to be White Knight diving into the middle of the team. Score Drinker has been procked alongside the Sterics, but Nuke Duck now the one in trouble. White Knight on the retreat. Zanzar in the midst of everybody, but you are in Italy. You have no business being there. Astralis now have to run for the hills before SK can get anything else. Blue continuing to chase down here, but SK. Nothing really left for them. <laughs> a bit of a cheeky uh, cloud burst into the Ophelios ultimate there. And it looks like they will be able to catch out Jekyll, but that's now the dunk down for Promise Q. But he's just buying space for the rest of his team. And Kadril, this mid late game for Astralis is all over the place. Yeah, it's falling apart. SK can turn towards the Baron again. And like I said, there's not enough spells from the face check. They have the Orana Ball, the Kai's W and Blue Orbs. That's all they have to check. And then eventually White Knight gets hit by a hook. I think Tink's played the fight perfectly to knock White Knight back. And then from there on, SK is just chasing them down. We saw it every fight. SK are the ones chasing Astralis down. Astralis can't turn and hit them. They can't force SK away. They can't re-engage. They can't turn with any damage. The Kai's has to run away. The Orana has to run away. And if you're in that position, it's really hard to win fights. So SK, clean player on Vision. I think Treat's been hitting so many hooks this game. As we watched again, like we said, this is going to be them going for the, bar the Dragon, sorry. And Gen X TP's above them. I think that's why perhaps they turned away from the Baron and they tried to look for an engage mid. Why not TP's behind them as well? And I think the Promise Key goes for the engage, but he goes in way too early, it felt like. He's kind of in the back line looking for the ult, but Blue flashed away, and now he's on the other side. He split from his team. He gets taken down. And Astralis looking at them like, well, we can't really fight because it is a 4v4, but Gen X is coming behind us. And then from there on, it just kind of fell apart. And yeah, I think no replay clear more clearly indicates what is a scattered call there. 
lots of members on this lineup getting caught out or forcing engages that they don't have the backup to do so. You can see this has been a very kind of steady game growing in favor of SK. Three to nine, the kill score again, pro approaching Ocean Soul here. Most certainly sole point for SK and for Astralis. The bleeding needed to stop uh, multiple kills ago, but it most certainly needs to stop now if they want to have hope of winning this game. Really smart play from SK here. They don't have any vision around mid, so they're just going through bot, telling Astral as well, we have Baron. If it's a base race, we're going to win. Now they're trying to face check again. Creeps again, finding the hook. White Knight a good frontliner for now. Genex trying to buy a bit more space, but no, Nuke Duck has been caught out. Big damage now coming through. Genex unkillable. Ophelios unstoppable on the backside here as Jeskla is just looking for the opportunity, but he can't. He does not have the damage. He does not have the space to work to find these kills. and. That might just be it, Kadrel. Yeah, this is the problem that Astralis has been facing the whole game long. They're either getting chased down or they have to face check. And this has been happening every fight. They could never set up a fight where they were the ones engaging, they were the ones running them down, or they were the ones catching them over vision, because after that Herald fight in the early game, it just fell apart for them. And brutal to watch as SK very effortlessly, it feels like, in these games. Obviously, great map calls across, never putting themselves in a position where they can really lose. But now that they've built this advantage, they are going to bring it home. Astralis and SK, two relatively brand new rosters setting foot on the stage here, but it is the rookies of SK who will find the win today. The veteranship of the Astralis lineup, not enough to find a win. Yeah, and I just think SK's comp overall was just solid overall. You know, you have so much team fight prowess, so much zone control. There's really not much that, SK, that uh, Astralis can do to answer it, especially if they're being chased down, they have to face check everything. There's really not much answer to it. And of course, rough game, but it is just one game for Astralis, but a solid start for SK overall. Again, this is a team almost entirely composed of rookies to the LEC stage, all things considered. So to see them show up, to see a player like Tinks, who has been denied LEC for so long, perform well in his first game is, is heartwarming in a way. It is good to see these guys be able to show up in that capacity. Of course, you can vote for your favorite, who you think had the biggest impact on Twitter. Key a player of the game at LEC, Gen X, Tinks, or Treats. We know who it is. Yeah, I mean, you look across all three, you know, Treats hitting all the hooks, Tink's just saying, screw it, I'm going in, and then Genax just sitting in their face like, come on, guys, you can kill me, can't you? And then they never did. <laughs> yeah, I... Renekton might be a scrim pick. Gragas is definitely a stage pick. And yeah. after the break, Laura's going to check in with Jezu as SK's new lineup kicked off the year with a win. Consider it gear. It's an extension of who I am. It blurs the line between fantasy and reality. Sometimes I can't tell myself from my machine. I think that's by design.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the LEC SK with a big W here to open the season and I have Jésus with me to talk about the game. Welcome to the LEC, Jésus! Thank you, Lo. Uh, I'm so happy to see you here with the uh, SK jersey, <laughs> everything, and I know how much you wanted to prove yourself in the LEC and how excited you were when you got in, so does this game match the expectations you had about the league? Uh, I mean, it's the first game, but it kind of does. Uh, I was so nervous about it. Uh, like, oh. I think you could see, uh, you could tell uh, from watching, but I'm really happy um, from how we perform, and I'm looking forward for the future. No, I can wait to see more from you. And I mean, I, I think you guys had a very solid performance, especially given the fact that you are a young team with a lot of rookies. So explain, uh, t talk me through the work you guys have been doing so far to get to this level today and how the synergy is going between you. I mean, we've just been uh, hardworking, like most, most of the team, I guess. Uh, we've been screaming a lot. And um, we actually put a lot of effort in solo queue, uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. and. Like we are building synergy between players and the atmosphere is super nice and everything. So for now, everything is great. That's amazing to hear. And a lot of people may not know it, but you're very young, a young player in leagues overall. I mean, you were playing in the LFL last year. So what are the main differences so far you can spot between the LFL level and the LEC level you have right now? Um, I would say the first difference is the stress. Obviously, my first LFL uh -huh. match, I was uh, super stressed, but uh, LEC is even more stressful for someone like me that is a pretty young player, as you said. Um, and besides that, uh, I guess the, the level is just uh, different, uh, like we can see in Scream or, um, or in competitive, it's just not the same level, so I'm really happy to be able to compete in this league. And this will be a new challenge for you. Uh, I hope now we have the player of the game for SK. This is your support, Shreed. So t tell me about him. How are you two playing together? Do you enjoy playing with him? How is it? <laughs> yeah, of course I enjoy playing with Shreed. He's a super nice guy, like uh, really, really nice, uh, super talented. Um, so I'm really happy we get him. And I think he's really like boosting the team as well. Uh, he's helping a lot because he's kind of like we are all quite rookies, but he knows a lot about the game. So I mean, it's just really valuable to work with him in the lane. And he's teaching me a lot. And a lot more to show from you too, I can imagine. But Jesus, thank you so much for the interview. And bienvenue en LEC. <laughs> thank you. Merci, Laure. Et fait carnage. And we are going to take a breath and we'll come back in a few minutes with Rogue versus Excel. Stay tuned, guys. <laughs> 